Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, welcome. I'm David Cowan, president of the museum, and we welcome back our friend Jason Zweig. Uh, Jason sits on the editorial board of our magazine, Financial History. He also is a former board of trustee member with us. Uh, he also sits on the editorial board of the Journal of Behavioral Finance. But you all know him from his personal finance column at the Wall Street Journal. Now, today he's here to discuss his latest book, The Devil's Financial Dictionary, a nice red on the cover. I know the last time you were here with your little book of safe money, that also had a red cover, but our, our PowerPoint's in blue, so thematically we're switching a little. But uh, Jason has written other books as well, for instance, Your Money and Your Brain. He edited also a uh, edition of Ben Graham's Classic Intelligent Investor, the revised edition. He also has co-edited another book about Ben Graham's essays. And he's going to join us next week as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Berkshire Hathaway here at the museum. And Jason is going to uh, be one of the moderators. Uh, just want our facts about Jason. Before he moved to the Wall Street Journal, he was at Money Magazine. And previous to that, he was at Forbes. Please welcome back our friend Jason Zweig. Thank you, David. Um, and what a great pleasure it is uh, to be here at the museum. And um, uh, I'm delighted to be back. And I'm delighted that on a gorgeous day like today, uh, a few people chose to uh, come down and sit in a basement. So uh, um, my new book uh, comes out on the 17th um, from Public Affairs Press. And actually, before we get started, I want to acknowledge a couple of people. I'd like to acknowledge John Mahaney, my great editor, um, who made this book so much better than the author, and also uh, Tony Ford, the book's publicist, and my former editor at the Wall Street Journal, Bob Sabat. Um, well, clap for John, too, and Tony. Uh, and Bob was really an inspiration because um, I just tried to make this book half as funny as he is, and um, I have no idea whether I succeeded. But So I'd like to talk a little bit about how this book came about and what I was trying to accomplish. So, oh, back in 1999, I started writing a little glossary um, that I had on my personal website. and. I think I stopped at about four or five entries because I got bored. I said, ah, oh, you know, there's a million of these things. Every website, every book, every, you know, reference you turn to has some glossary and they're all terrible. Nobody ever reads them. They're not informative. They're not fun. And so a couple of years ago, um, my teenage daughters were um, mocking me. Um, which is not unusual, but uh, they were mocking me for a specific reason, because my website was so antiquated. Because I really hadn't done much to refresh the design or the concept since I started it in the, in the late 90s. And so I, I committed to redesign it, and then I was struggling with this difficulty, which is some of you who might read my column know that I'm defiantly not short-term oriented. I don't write about how you should respond to the latest noise in the markets. And so I said, well, I have to have fresh material on this website, because if I don't, not only will nobody return, but chances are nobody will come in the first place. So how can I have something that's fresh, that changes from time to time, that's short and snappy and makes it seem worthwhile visiting and revisiting? And I was just kind of staring out the window. And there on my bookshelf, I was at home, uh, was one of my three copies of The Devil's Dictionary by Ambrose Bierce. And I'll just, that's, this is my book. But uh, this, is, uh, this is actually the first final edition of The Devil's Dictionary. It was originally published in 1906, but um, under the title, The Cynic's Word Book, a title that Bierce hated. 
And he finally convinced his publisher to publish it under the title The Devil's Dictionary. So I was looking at The Devil's Dictionary and I said, that's what I'll do. And I just started writing these things um, at home in the evenings and over the weekend, never at work, Bob. And, <laughs> and um, uh, I didn't think much of it. I wrote a handful, and then I, I guess I had 20, and the next thing I knew I had 50. And, and one evening I was sitting there working on it, and my wife called out from the living room, would you be quiet? Because apparently there I was sitting in the kitchen, and I was cackling to myself without any metacognition that I was being disruptive. And that was the moment when it sort of clicked for me. I said, you know, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's funny, but obviously I think it's funny. So maybe other people will too. So I started, you know, just putting them all up on my website as I wrote them. And um, my agent, who couldn't be here today, said, well, these are really funny, but, you know, you, nobody will, you'll never sell this as a book. No publisher would ever want it. Uh, and then one thing led to another, and lo and behold, it became a book. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Ambrose Bierce and the original Devil's Dictionary, this is Bierce. He was a close contemporary of Mark Twain's. He was born in 1842. He is believed to have died in 1914, although no one really knows. Um, Bierce was probably the single most cynical person ever to inhabit the Western Hemisphere. Uh, uh, he, he, I think I can safely say he hated everyone and everything. Um, every single institution of American life, government, religion, community, marriage, you name it. He did get married, he did have kids. He seems to have hated his family as well, and I'm sure the feeling was mutual. Um, and sometime around 1914, he communicated with one of his daughters and said, there's a revolution going on in Mexico, um, and I'm paraphrasing, I think I will go march into the line of fire and see if anybody will shoot me. And he was never heard from again. So, uh, But he was uh, at least as brilliant a, uh, a humorist as Mark Twain. And here are, here are a few examples. Everyone has heard this famous definition from Bierce, love, noun, a temporary insanity curable by marriage. Um, and it goes on from there, but so then there's also, this is a favorite of mine, jealous, adjective, unduly concerned about the preservation of that which can be lost, only if not worth keeping. Uh, and here's one that's near and dear to our hearts today here at the museum, finance, noun, the art or science of managing revenues and resources for the best advantage of the manager. Uh, and he also was very innovative in the way he wrote this dictionary. Anybody who's ever seen something like uh, the Oxford English Dictionary, or before that, the later editions of Samuel Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language, knows that often the definition is followed by a usage. And so Bierce was very creative. So he would give his definition, which was funny, like road, noun, a strip of land along which one may pass from where it is too tiresome to be to where it is futile to go. And then he wrote this uh, little poem, all roads, Sorry, all roads, howsoe'er they diverge, lead to Rome. Whence, thank the good Lord, at least one leads back home. And he attributed it to this uh, imaginary medieval English poet, sorry, Bory the Bald. So um, I call these flights of fancy, and I sort of adopted this technique um, for my own dictionary. And we'll, we'll get to a couple of those in a minute.